You'll be helped, as always, if your Bibles are open to the text we're preaching through. Uh, t this morning, it is, I almost said tonight, but that was last night. This morning, we're looking at Matthew chapter 1. And you'll see that the Gospel of Matthew begins with a genealogy. It begins with a genealogy. And I suspect, if we're honest, many of us would admit that when we open up the Gospel of Matthew, we skip past the genealogy. Or is that just me? In fact, that's what we did in this service. When Lindsay Cancino read from Matthew 1, we had him start at verse 18, because we didn't want to trouble you with all those names. To the contemporary reader, genealogies appear to us as a tedious list of names. Names of persons whom we know scarcely anything about. Is it really important for us to know that so-and-so is the father of so-and-so who is the father of so-and-so? As we seek to answer this, we must bear in mind to whom this gospel is addressed. To whom this gospel is addressed. Matthew, the author, is Jewish, and he is primarily addressing his fellow countrymen. And this dynamic massively influences how he organizes his gospel. Matthew, in a very pronounced way, presents Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecies around a coming Messiah. From the very outset of this gospel, Matthew presents Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises made to his people. Yahweh, the Lord, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, has declared, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In the days, in his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. You see, Matthew aims to connect prophecies like the one in Jeremiah with the advent of Jesus sewing together things promised in the Hebrew Scriptures with things that were fulfilled in Jesus. Accordingly, even though you'll see the genealogy begins with Abraham, Matthew begins his gospel with a focus on David. It begins the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Many of the Old Testament prophecies note that the Messiah will emerge from King David's lineage. And so this genealogy is vital at establishing the fulfillment of that particular detail. For Matthew, this genealogy is his opening argument for demonstrating to his fellow countrymen that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Matthew then transitions from the Messiah's human connections to the Messiah's divine connection in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. It is no small point of Christian doctrine to say that Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit and has a physical birth. The Christology that presents Jesus as fully God and fully man emerges from the realities described in this chapter and in passages like John chapter 1. 
Matthew wants us to know that this was promised long ago. And so he cites Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I don't know how you feel about the doctrine of the virgin birth. Over the years, I've had many discussions with many churchgoers about the veracity of this claim. If there are any of you who struggle with this particular point of doctrine, you may be interested in me sharing an experience I had several years ago. At the time, I was a very young pastor. I was ordained at age 25, so as I recall, this would have been in my late 20s. And I was at a dinner party, and it was getting close to Christmas time. And there was a young lady at the dinner party who learned that I was a pastor. And so she came up to me, and the first thing she said to me was, I don't believe in God, you know. No, hello, hello my name is so-and-so, pleased to meet you. How's your evening going? Just, you know I don't believe in God. It was a rather unusual way to open a conversation. I knew I was in for a little bit of a debate of sorts. Then she followed up her opening comment about not believing in God by asking, you don't believe in the virgin birth, do you? Everybody knows you have to have physical relations to have a child. She said it much more crudely, but I'm in a church, and I don't think you want the verbatim statement. You don't believe in the virgin birth, do you? Everybody knows you have to have physical relations to have a baby. I responded by saying that I am entirely convinced of the truthfulness and accuracy of the description of the virgin birth. But before she had a chance to respond, I asked her a couple of questions as well. I began with her, I said, so let me get this straight. You don't believe in God at all. She said, that's right, don't believe in God at all. Okay, and you don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. No, no, absolutely not. So then I said, well, before you evaluate the wisdom of me believing in the virgin birth, I need you to consider a couple of things. I do believe in God. And the God I believe in is all-powerful. And he's a personal God. The God I believe in created this world, this universe, and everything in it. Now, if this God that I'm describing exists, don't you think, in light of his vast power, that a virgin birth would be a rather easy thing for him to accomplish. Don't you think that in comparison to what is required to create a universe and to sustain a universe, that a virgin birth is small potatoes? It's what God could come up with on a coffee break. I wish I could tell you that the young lady was immediately won over by my debating skills and that she became a Christian on the spot that evening, but of course that didn't happen. However, I did have a breakthrough, and the breakthrough was this. The young lady understood that her rejection of the virgin birth was the logical overflow of her denial of the existence of God. She was simply being consistent. And then she came to understand that my affirmation of the virgin birth was also a very logical outcome or overflow of my belief in an all-powerful God. So friends, what I want to begin with this morning is to say don't let anyone ever make you feel embarrassed for affirming the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Because if you believe in the God of the Scripture, you believe in a God for whom nothing is too difficult. 
I mean, we think of how immense and complex this world is. And this world is just a small part of a galaxy, which is a small part of the universe, and all of it comes from the God we worship. Virgin birth is easy stuff. Not only is the virgin birth achieved by a God who is all-powerful, but the manner of God the Son's advent is quite sensible and very strategic. The manner of the advent of God's Son is not simply a function of power, but it's sensible and it's strategic. In order to represent God to us, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Pastor David Platt provides a very helpful, simple illustration on this point. David Platt recounts the day when he proposed to his wife. He asked his wife to marry him. David Platt says, as any man would say, he never thought for an instant that he should send someone else to ask his wife in his place. You don't send a surrogate to ask a woman to be your wife. In matters of love, in matters of supreme love, you must do this yourself. And this is what is so uniquely spectacular about the advent of Jesus. In this matter of love and reconciliation, God personally shows up in the person of Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit. At the same time, Jesus, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, is also physically born. Physically born. And this, too, is significant. Because we need to think through the possibilities here. God could have ordained for the incarnation of the Son to bypass physical birth. God could have ordained that the advent of his son would by bypass childhood altogether. As we have observed in other parts of the Old Testament, there are incarnations of the Godhead in Hebrew history where the incarnated one shows up in the appearance of an adult. But this wasn't God's design for this mission to properly represent the human race, to properly represent you and me, it was important for Jesus to be born as a child like any of us. And I don't want our usual Christmas lyrics to confuse you. Away in a manger, you know, one of the lyrics says, no crying he makes. He was crying. I can assure you, as I deduce what I find in Scripture, baby Jesus was crying. He was cooing. He was sleeping. He was making a mess in his diapers. And that's not sacrilege. He was truly human. It may have been a holy night, but it certainly was not a silent night. Picture with me. Picture with me what has taken place. The eternal Son of God, who knows all things and can do all things, submits to the vulnerability that is associated with human birth. Think of it. Eternity is his dwelling place, as it were. He knows everything. He can do anything. And he submits to the vulnerability of a human baby. This means that the Son of God, who in eternity needed nothing, fully as independent and self-sufficient as any being could ever be, now depends on a mother now depends on a father for food, for clothing, for changing the clothing, and for shelter. Think of this. The Son of God, 
who by His Spirit authored the Hebrew Scriptures, now needs someone to teach him how to read. He has to learn and he has to rediscover all that he knew in eternity. Why? The author of Hebrews provides an explanation saying he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now that's divinely inspired as an explanation. Uh, this is second, secondary, but it's very helpful. The reformer John Calvin says it well. And, and if you ever need to explain to someone why it's important for Jesus to be fully God and fully man, this is the quote for you. Calvin says, since neither as God alone could Jesus feel death, nor as man alone could he overcome it, he coupled human nature with divine, that to atone for sin, he might submit the weakness of the one to death, and that wrestling with death by the power of the other nature, he might win victory for us. It's one of the most important quotes I can think of in terms of the nature of Jesus, the Son. Back to Matthew 1. The angel says to Joseph, Mary will bear you a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, as God alone, Jesus can't represent you and me. And as man alone, he doesn't have the capacity to pay for our sins. We need a Savior who is fully God and fully man. We need a Savior who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and physically born to a woman. In short, we need Jesus as he is described here in the New Testament. The answer to our greatest need, our greatest need is answered with the birth of God's Son in human history. In Jesus, the promises of God are fulfilled. In Jesus, all of our needs are met. I want us to linger with this because I talk to people all the time and what we describe as needs may be legitimate. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We have legitimate needs, but our most pressing needs, all of them, are met in Jesus. And so if you are lacking something, if you are lacking something, there's a good chance it's not what you really need. Because what we really need is provided in Jesus. Everything that is given to us outside of Jesus is a grace, a blessing, something we give thanks for. But every child of God lacks nothing in terms of what we really need. And so we celebrate at Christmas. We give gifts. And I don't want you to disrespect your family at Christmas. Say, this is wonderful. Uh, Pastor Brynn says, I don't really need it. I'm just going to set it over here. No, thank, thank the people who give you lovely, kind gifts. But at Christmas, when we give our gifts, remember that the greatest gift is Jesus Christ. And that when we die and go to heaven, the greatest blessing will be to see Jesus face to face. Amen.